the dancing. Um, my wife says that I dance like a gringo. What about, I think Latinas are born dancing, and so it's just natural with them. She dances very well. And every time I dance, she laughs at me. <laughs> I'm uh, reading from Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Now, it's difficult preaching through an entire book. Usually, I have like three points to do. I have more. Uh, Norm would say it'd be good if I made one point. But anyway, Ecclesiastes 1, 1 and 2. The words of the teacher, son of David, came to Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. Now, I believe that probably all of us have asked the question, why am I here? What is my purpose in life? I remember growing up, I asked that question a lot, and even sometimes today I still ask that question, why am I here? Well, Solomon was also not only asking the question, he was trying to find the answer. And some have said the book of Proverbs reflects Solomon's wisdom, the Ecclesiastes reflects his foolishness. And so I want to look at just some of the things that he tried to find purpose in life. Uh, can we turn on the power plate, please, uh, Francisco? Okay, first of all, the first purpose in life that he was trying to find was in wisdom and in knowledge. Now, wisdom and knowledge are not the same thing. Knowledge refers to acquiring of information. Wisdom is to make smart choices as a result of it. And when Solomon started out as a leader, first off, he got, you know, God told him you can have whatever you want, and he asked for wisdom. And he was given wisdom because uh, his reputation spread around the world. It went even so far as uh, Sheba, when the Queen of Sheba decided to go check it out for herself. And when she was leaving, she said, your wisdom is even greater than your reputation. Now, we have a lot of knowledge today. In fact, we live in a knowledge explosion. Uh, we're soon going to reach 8 billion people in the world. And we have that many people. There's a lot of knowledge. Uh, we are is this? The quantum computer. Well, they're working on this. And this thing will be amazing when it is finally perfected. Uh, it's supposed to take just a few minutes to make a calculation that would take over a thousand years for a supercomputer. It's going to be about great changes. There's also a fusion, a nuclear fusion, to produce energy. That was the kind of energy produced by the sun, and people are trying to reproduce that now. Well, they've actually got it working, but only for about five seconds at a time, but they hope within a few years to have it so that there's unlimited energy, and there's unlimited supply for it. Just this last week, the James Webb Telescope began to show some of the pictures that he had taken, and they were already discovering things that they could not even have imagined. It is so sophisticated, so sharp, that it's able to see, according to the scientists, 13.2 billion years in the past. Now the reason they calculate like that is the light from those systems began shining towards us 13.2 light years away. And so they're finding out things and it's so clear it's going to revolutionize our understanding of astrophysics. Now despite all the knowledge that we have, it does not mean that we're wise if we look in the United States, we find people that are shooting people in schools, in churches, in shopping centers, and it's happening sometimes more than one a day. It's become so prevalent, it's not even making news sometimes. We have powerful countries that are invading weaker countries 
and destroying vast populations. We don't have the wisdom to stop that. We do not have the wisdom to bring peace on earth. In 1 Corinthians 13, 2, it says, If I have all knowledge and wisdom and have not love, it is nothing. So despite a, a knowledge explosion, we still don't really even have knowledge, have wisdom. And as Solomon was looking at his life, he concluded that despite the fact that he had some wisdom, that it was vanity. It was meaningless. It was empty. Uh, Simon Bolivar of South America, uh, towards the end of his life, said it seemed that his whole life was plowing furrows in the sea. And in Proverbs 9, 10, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so Solomon finds no purpose in life from all the wisdom that he has. Then secondly, he tried to find a purpose in wealth. In chapter 2, verse 8, It says, I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasures of kings and provinces. He had a lot of money. He acquired a lot. He built up his kingdom so that it was greater than any before, and he presumed greater than any after. He was proud of everything that he had accomplished through his wealth. Uh, Jesus even referred to the, the splendor of Solomon's court. But despite all of that, the riches really did not produce anything of value for him. 1 Timothy 6, 10, and 11 says, The love of money is the root of all evil. doesn't say that money in itself is bad, but the love of money is. Uh, even if people acquire money, what do they really have? I, I read an alarming statistic. You know, we have all kinds of professional athletes, And some of them make right now over $35 million a year in their contracts. A lot of money. But it also reported that within three years after they retire, some 80% of them are broke. They put lotteries, I was reading, in places where there are poor people because those are the ones that play the lottery. But even if they win the lottery, Within five years, 70% of those are broke as well. Even in Christianity, you can turn on the television and you can watch preachers that are talking about the prosperity gospel. That is a perversion of the gospel itself. There is no prosperity gospel. They say if you contribute to them that God is going to bless you in return and give you more than you can spend, Well, they didn't look at the life of Christ because the Bible says that Jesus gave up all of his riches and became poor that we might be rich. Not in material things, but in spiritual things. All the money in the world is of no purpose. Uh, There was a story told about a young wife and she was talking to her her husband. She said, I wish that we were rich so that we didn't have to struggle at the end of every month. And he said, well, dear, we have everything. He said, we, we're married to each other. We love each other. We have a happy marriage. God provides for us everything that we need day by day. He said, we're already rich, and maybe one day we'll have money also. As Solomon was looking at all of his vast wealth, his conclusion was that it was meaningless vanity, empty. There was no purpose to be found in money. And then thirdly, uh, there is, he tried to find purpose in pleasure. Now, he had a lot of money, so he could enjoy, he could indulge in drinking and entertainment as much as was available in that day. He also had uh, 700 wives, 300 concubines. That you would think, might have produced some pleasure. I think not. That wasn't a very wise thing to do at all. But nevertheless, he had all of that. And in looking at the pleasure of life, he found likewise that it was empty. We live in an age that looks forward to entertainment. Entertain me. Entertain me. 
I, I, my f grandfather, I called him Grandpa. Grandpa was born in 1892. And he was talking about the things that he did as a young boy. One of his entertainments was cracking a whip. They had cattle, and he had to learn how to use the whip. I bought a whip one day, and he had to teach me how to use it. It's, it's not as easy as it looks. And that was part of his entertainment. And then he would tell me that on Sunday, they would hitch up the wagon with the horse, and they would go to church not once but twice. And that provided socialization, and it also provided worship for them. That was a major source of entertainment. The rest of the week, he was working as a farmer. Today, we have all kinds of things to entertainment. In the 1950s, and I was born early in the 50s, they began to have television, black and white. Those of you that remember only black and white, I remember the first color TV that came about. I thought, boy, this is amazing. We have television 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have movies. There are casinos built for entertainment. Uh, we, have, uh, we have casinos where you can go and spend all of your money. Some consider that entertainment. Uh, there's Walt Disney World and other things. All these things to entertain us. In fact, if you have $100,000 laying aside, you can have a junket going into space for a few minutes at least, and then you come back again. You can, go, you can be an astronaut if you have money, and that is the entertainment that we have. But Solomon tried entertainment, and he said it's vanity. It's meaningless. There is no purpose. You cannot find purpose only by pleasures of life. And then uh, there, he tried to find purpose in fame. In chapter 2, verse 9, he says, I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. Now, Solomon had his reputation. His name was well known. And it seems that people today really want to be famous. They want to be known by others. There was a survey taken of teenage girls, and it found that they would rather be a gopher for a famous person than to be a politician or a successful business person. That was what was most important to them. And, you know, everybody today seems to be looking for some kind of fame. I, in, in, there are halls of fame for all of the sports. Uh, baseball Hall of Fame, the Basketball Hall of Fame, and the one that I follow at least a little bit, the Football Hall of Fame. And in the Football Hall of Fame, there are all these people like Walter Payton, some of you remember him, Peyton Manning, and uh, then uh, Jerry Rice, and Mean Joe Green. All of these are famous people. They're in the Hall of Fame. But God has a Hall of Fame. And the question is not whether you are in the Hall of Fame that people recognize but is your name in God's Hall of Fame? The Bible says that that is what is most important, not the opinion of other men. The important thing is the opinion of God in your life. Is your life significant before God? Are you in His Hall of Fame? And then, fifth, he tried to find purpose in work. Chapter 2, verse 4. It says, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. There was the work. And he accomplished a lot of significant things. You remember the temple that David, his father, was not able to build? Solomon built that a huge structure, and even though it's been destroyed twice in history, there are still some parts of the foundation that are still there. He built aqueducts. He built palaces. He built all kinds of things. He expanded the kingdom so that it was larger than at any time in all of history, even to today. 
His kingdom was the biggest. A lot of things didn't work. You know, we men put a lot of our stock, a lot of who we are is in our work. Women are smarter than that by and large. In the prison, I actually supervised like eight different departments, and I had heads of departments that were men and women. I found by and large, the women were more creative and worked harder than the men. But the men put a lot of their ego in their work. If two men meet, often one will begin to say, or one will be asked, you know, what, sh what do you do for a living? And we have high status jobs in the eyes of people, maybe a doctor or a judge, and there are those that are considered low status, like a garbage collector, or as my mother would say, a, a ditch digger. Those are not considered so high in status with men, but with God, it's a different matter altogether. What is your job? What do you work for? Solomon looked at all the work that he had done, and he found it to be vanity, emptiness, meaningless. There was no purpose in his work. Then finally, actually there are a lot more, but I'm only looking at six. The final one that he looks at is the purpose in God. And it says in uh, chapter 8, verse 13, the Lord Almighty is the only one you are to regard as holy. He is the only one that you are to fear. Finding the purpose in God. That ultimately is your only purpose. The one that is eternal. The one that actually has meaning for your life. And unless we find our meaning in God in something bigger than ourselves then we have nothing but emptiness and vanity. It is only in God that we become who we were designed to be. We are not just random bits of cells that are put together. We are all here for a purpose, and that purpose is to be found in God. Jesus said in John 4, 34, My food, or in the King James it says, My meat is to do the will of the one who sent me. His purpose in life was to know and to do the will of God. That is our purpose as well. That is why we are here. Paul says in Ephesians 1.11, almost the same thing. He said, it is in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Why are you here? You're here for God. Rick Warren wrote a popular book a few years ago called The Purpose Driven Life. And he looks at five different things. I'm not going to look at all of those. There are two that I think that are very significant, and I think they tie in with the greatest commandment. Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Loving God means that you worship Him. Now, I've talked to people over the years, and they don't want to worship God. They don't want to acknowledge anyone or anything bigger than themselves, and so they try to live the, their lives for themselves. You know, I don't want to worship me. I want to worship one that is infinitely greater than I one that is worthy of worship. And the worship is not just something that takes place on Sunday morning. Worship is a lifetime experience. Each and every day, we are created to be able to worship our God. We stand in His presence, and we worship Him. And then secondly, there is service. We are created for service before God. Jesus said, the greatest among you will be the servant of all. How does God judge the effect that we have on our lives, the purpose of our lives? It is by the service that we give to God, and we show that by loving our neighbors. You know, the, the scripture that we adopted for our church, 
is from Matthew chapter 25. And it says, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was in prison and you visited me. I was naked and you gave me clothes. We have tried to do every one of those things. And that is our purpose. That is why we are here. To worship God. To be his servant. And the only real meaning, the only lasting purpose in your life is going to be with God. I read about uh, a man in Korea, a Christian, and someone asked him the question one day, what's your job? And he said, my job is being a Christian. The man said, well, no, what is your job? And he said, well, I work to earn a living, but my job is being a Christian. So should we all have that job, worshiping God and serving Him. All else, according to one of the wisest men in all of history, is vanity, emptiness, meaninglessness. Would you bow with me as we pray? Gracious God and Almighty Savior, we come before you. And Lord, we know that without you, we are nothing and nothing is important apart from your perfect will. We pray that you might continue to mold us and remake us in your image day by day. Forgive us, O oh God, for where we fail and we fall short of that goal. God, we love you and we praise you. And we count it a privilege today to be able to come together in your house that we might worship you and serve you. In Jesus' name, amen.